the ability to not break the law, that's not really a selling point in, in any other industries. If we build on a permission chain, we're not actually innovating. Hello everybody, this is Value Tokenize with Masha and Xenia. Please welcome Benjamin Hauser, CEO of Hyperlink, who are building a blockchain protocol to tokenize the global asset ecosystem. Uh, Benjamin will tell us about why compliance is not a good selling point for any product in security token space, why they're opposed to the end-to-end -end type of solutions, and what country is the best place to be right now. Hi Benjamin, thank you very much for joining us today at Value Tokenize. Can you tell us more about Hyperlink because we hear a lot about you in security token like Infospace and you travel a lot so we'll be very interested in knowing what your next plans are. Yeah, so Hyperlink Technology is a startup. We're a group of nerds and visionaries with a passion for blockchain. So we see a huge opportunity in the security token space. Blockchain seems like a really obvious fit for securities. Given that the current legacy systems often date back as far as the Cold War, they're long overdue for an update. I personally came into this space around 2013, when the narrative back then was one of libertarianism and disruption and you know, topple the banks, reinvent the system. As the market matures, uh, as the space in general matures, I'm seeing firsthand that you know, we're never going to affect change from the outside. We can't just sit around and sing Kumbaya and change the world. And so it really excites me now to see this intersection between crypto and traditional finance. And I think that eventually security tokens are going to become the norm and we'll drop the token qualifier altogether and they'll simply be securities. So we at Hyperlink have some kind of novel ideas about how to get from where we are today to where we want to be in 10 years, say, and that's what we're working on. Can you tell us where we want to be in 10 years? Like, what, what is your vision for of this future? Yeah, I, well, I think that the really exciting thing is eventually targeting public markets, right? The, the disintermediation of the public markets. So the whole public market kind of, like all of the intermediaries sprung up because it's really difficult to trade these things at scale. You know, it started as a few guys meeting in a stock exchange in, I think it was Amsterdam, right? And then it just grew from city to city and you have people riding horses between the cities and then that gets confusing. And so you start having people keeping centralized ledgers so that they don't have to ride back and forth. And the whole thing just keeps growing because it's too hard to move these physical certificates around the world. And now finally through blockchain, we have the ability where peer-to-peer -peer trustless transactions are actually capable. So like long-term, that's what really excites me is this idea that we could actually have true peer-to-peer -peer trading within public markets and that just everything that's currently happening between the execution and the settlement of a trade doesn't really need to be there. I think that that's pretty radical stuff and I, I really feel that's inevitable. And can you tell us how Hyperlink is contributing to that? For example, about like SFT protocol? Because like what we see as this like ideal future that we need to have like in 10 years. And I think you're creating this future right now, as it seems. Yeah, I mean, as much as public markets are the really exciting thing, the kind of status quo, the people that are already there have very, very deep pockets and very good connections, right? It would be incredibly naive for me to think that I can just step up and, you know, reinvent this space. And so we see the, the kind of better point of entry for blockchain technology. So to that end, what Hyperlink is working on right now is the SFT protocol, which is a protocol for the issuance of securities on the Ethereum blockchain. And our focus is specifically on private equity. So private equity markets, they're less centralized. There are less kind of existing powers that are, have deep control. And we think that that's a better place to kind of introduce blockchain technology. Our focus to date has been on the regulatory requirements in the United States, particularly we're really excited about what's going on in Wyoming. Our design is super modular. Uh, and the idea being that it should in theory, be able to fit the requirements of a lot of jurisdictions, most major jurisdictions. And we really favor handling as much logic as possible on chain. We want to maximize the transparency and auditability. I have this kind of thing that I like to think about where, you know, in 2004, Google goes public and in their prospectus, it says, don't be evil. 
And everybody was really excited about that. And then, you know, now they're basically just a tool for the NSA to see what you're up to. Compare that to 2014, Adam Beck from Blockstream said, you know, blockchain enables us to say can't be evil. And that's really what we're going for when we talk about being like maximizing logic on chain. I think that whenever you're reliant for off-chain approval, you can't be 100% certain of the reason that the action was blocked. So if your transfer doesn't go through, is it because you violated one of the compliance rules? Or is it because the authority that was meant to sign the transfer, you know, their interests were not aligned with yours. With our protocol, we're, we're handling as much as we can on chain, just because we want it to be that when your transfer fails, you can look and see exactly what blocked it. There's no ambiguity or confusion in anything. Another thing is that we're very deal oriented as opposed to compliance oriented. I mean, not to say that we, we don't, you know, meet compliance needs, but the ability to not break the law that's not really a selling point in, in any other industry. So I don't really see why it should be in this industry. The real goal here is to kind of actually bring value to, to issuers and to save them time and money and provide things that they can't already do, not to just be you know, regulatory compliant. So that's a perfect description of what a deal-oriented approach is. Yeah, we actually wanted to ask about that. Uh, yeah, so like I was saying, if, if your main feature is regulatory compliance, then you aren't really solving any existing problem in the market. So why would anyone actually want to use your protocol, right? Uh, we don't yeah. have a situation where we have all these companies walking around going, oh, woe is me, I've just broken so many securities laws today. Like, there was a way to stop breaking the law. It's not like that, right? Yeah. So of course, our protocol absolutely can meet regulatory needs, but we're not pushing that. That's not our selling feature because that should be expected shouldn't be a thing that we even have to say. You know, we can do detailed cap table tracking on chain. We can enforce transfer restrictions. All of that stuff is in our public GitHub repo. We made that code public because it's not secret sauce. It's not proprietary stuff. If an issuer only cares about compliance, they can hire devs and fork our code. I'll help them deploy it. Our business focus, like I say, is, is deal oriented. We want to actually meet the needs of issuers in the real world and help save them time and money. So we're doing stuff like, uh, on-chain vestible stock options, on-chain liens against assets, enforcing terms of a shareholder's agreement, like drag along, tag along rules, right of first refusal, exercising appraisal rights, automating liquidation events. Those are a few examples of the stuff that we're doing that we think is actually interesting, like ways that we can use blockchain to automate processes or provide transparency into things that were previously super opaque and slow processes. A lot of players in the market are introducing so to say, the end-to-end -end solutions, like all-in-one cases. But when you, if your articles, you describe this approach as kind of a walled garden that uh, prevents the industry from moving forward. Can you elaborate more on that? Absolutely. I think first we should start by defining what a walled garden is, because I've seen confusion around that in some of the Telegram groups. Basically, if a protocol is designed so that at any point in its process, there's a single company or like a consortium of companies that have complete control over the use of the protocol, that's a walled garden. So just because your private blockchain tokens can list across multiple exchanges doesn't mean that your private chain is not walled off. It doesn't have to necessarily be end-to-end -end only controlled by one party. It's just as long as you have that that choke point where your company gets to decide who enters, where you get to be the gatekeeper, you've created a walled garden. So why are we opposed to this? Well, another favorite buzzword in the industry is interoperability, right? And that broadly means the ability for two different products to interact with one another. In the walled garden approach, where you have everything running through that single point, it's very limited in what it can interact with, right? And the network effect is real. Like how many people do you suppose right now don't really want to be on Facebook anymore, but they're still there just because all their friends are there. It's, it's the easy way to talk to them. So if you as a company are building a walled garden setup, it's only going to grow, I guess, as fast as your company can scale to grow it. And maybe in the short term, you'll make a lot of money. But in the long term, a more open approach that allows multiple companies to set up that can offer competing services I think that's going to end up winning out because of the network effect, because over time, more and more people will get there. And so then when new issuers and new investors choose where they want to be, they'll say, oh, look at that one. Look how much is going on there. It's just eventually you're going to get eclipsed by something bigger. So that's why we're so opposed to walled gardens. And do you think many of the key industry players right now are building this walled gardens or still you see effort to, you know, 
um, collaborate and to be more interoperable? I think that there's a pretty wide variant of what's going on. There are definitely some companies that are building setups that I would ask them why they even need blockchain. Like I, I've seen a couple where no one even controls their private keys. And in that case, what they're doing is using the blockchain as a, as a really slow and efficient database. It's more really just a marketing thing. They can just say, oh, we added blockchain. Um, but on the other end, there are a lot of companies building really cool open source stuff, building on public chains. And even if they're not exposing their, their code, even if they're not going open source with the code, they're giving endpoints and they're working with other companies to kind of encourage interoperability between the assets. So yes and no, I guess. And what about privacy? So one of the arguments for the Small Gardens approach is that the ability to preserve this ultimate safety of, uh, of the client. Uh, so how do you react to that? Yeah, that's uh, privacy is a huge obstacle when you deal with a public gene. And we've certainly given a lot of thought to that. No, invest no institutional investor is ever going to want their entire portfolio visible to everyone. Honestly, like what investor would really want their whole, whole portfolio exposed? Similarly, CEO isn't going to want their stock options visible to every single employee. Issuers are not going to want secondary trades being publicly visible because that could, that could affect their valuation. Like, there's a lot of really big considerations when information is publicly visible. I mean, we looked at the permission route. We took calls with Corda. There are some brilliant minds working on permission to chains, but at the end of the day, I just couldn't get past that it really felt like if we build on a permission chain, we're not actually innovating. All we're doing is creating the next iteration of the way the market already is today, right? We're just making it more efficient for the people that already control the market to control the market. And arguably, with a permissioned approach, you're actually introducing the need for more trust because no longer are you just trusting your broker. You're now having to trust your information through all of these authority nodes and trusted signers. So we really, really didn't want to go the permission route. And fortunately, while I was stressing and trying to figure out how to solve this, there were some guys in London, uh, it's called the Aztec Protocol, and they just you know, invented privacy on public chain. So Aztec built a, a protocol doing zero knowledge proofs on Ethereum. It's really impressive tech. Uh, everybody was thinking we would need to modify the core EVM on Ethereum in order to do this, and they just managed it with a smart contract. We've been working pretty deeply with the Aztec guys for a few months now, and we're really excited to say we've integrated their protocol into our own. So that lets us offer a really high level of confidentiality on balances and transfers and still retain most of the on-chain governance stuff that we also value. We're super excited about this because of the huge barrier to adoption that, that privacy brings. Why did you choose Ethereum to build on in the first place? We chose Ethereum, I mean, given our focus, like our real core values are for transparency, audibility, and inclusiveness, right? So the permission chain just doesn't fit. Uh, the permission chain, as I said, it, it arguably requires more trust of third parties, and you're just making it more efficient for the people that already run things. So it really had to be a public chain. And then because of how much we want to handle on chain, we really, we needed Turing completeness. Most of these approaches that are happening on like public permissioned chains like uh, Stellar or Blockstream's elements, these chains lack Turing completeness. And so everything ultimately still has to be signed off by some authority node. And it's really, I mean, it's slightly better than the permissioned approach, but it's still, it's not audible. It's not transparent why things are happening. So needing Turing completeness, I mean, there's not really a lot of choices. Most chains that have that are either Ethereum or they're just, they ported it over the EVM. So Ethereum is by far the most tested. It's the most mature. It's got the most existing infrastructure. You know, exchanges understand ERC-20. Wallets exist for it. Most investors have at least a, you know, slight understanding of what they're looking at. So it just for today, it really seemed like the obvious choice to us. I mean, that said, we're not married to Ethereum. Like if there ever is a valid reason to move to another chain, we absolutely will. We're also not chain agnostic. You know, a lot of people really like to toss that phrase around, but what we built just won't work on most other chains. 
And in my opinion, when, when people talk about being chain agnostic and they say that it's ready to use across many blockchains, it's generally one of two things. They're either spewing buzzwords without thinking about what they're saying, or they're selling a vaporware product or both. I mean, it's really, really easy to port nothing across all the chains. But when you've actually got a solid code base, it's, it's hard enough on one, never mind doing it on all of them. And uh, where do you think in the world is uh, the industry most advanced and educated? So is it the US and not Europe, for example? Well, our focus is the United States. And the reason for that is that the United States has the largest private placement market by a wide margin. 2018, there were over $300 billion of deals compared to less than half of that for the entire EU. So I think that the reason that you see so many private equity deals happening in the US is because they have a very well-established legal system there. Everybody knows exactly what they can and can't do. And they know that there's a really strong court system. So if somebody does defraud you, you can sue them. And there actually will be repercussions for that. Standard due diligence on any deal, if you're a sophisticated investor, one of the first things you're going to look at is where is this deal originating from? And if everything goes wrong, how hard will it be for me to take legal action and recover some of my losses? So I think that as a really serious issuer, you know, if you want access to serious capital, you're going to need to look at the United States. There are a lot of countries right now that are kind of, you know, with open arms, come here, we'll streamline the process, it'll be super easy. But you have to think, you know, like, if you have the opportunity to invest in a project that's in the States or the same project in some little nothing island in the Caribbean, you're probably going to go with the one that has a much stronger court system. So yeah, if the investors want to be in the States and then the issuers want to be in the States to get access to the investors, to that end, we want to be in the States to be able to offer our services to, to a more serious clientele, which we're going to find in the United States. And can you tell us a little bit about the obstacles that you're facing and that the industry in general is facing that prevents further adoption and development? Yeah, absolutely. Andy Singleton from Above Board, he wrote a really interesting article not too long ago, and he said, the real STO market outlook near death. It was really, really circulated and everybody was kind of scared for Yeah, we read this one. <laughs> yeah. So he brought up a really interesting point, and that was that nobody's buying any of these security tokens. And his hypothesis on that was that just most of these offerings, frankly, are not very good offerings. So I think that he was right. We in an industry, we, we kind of live in an echo chamber, you know, we sit around on Telegram and Twitter all day and talk about how blockchain is superior, it's going to change the world, we're reinventing finance, and we all know this stuff to be true. But when you get outside of those networks, your average investor, they don't care, a lot of them don't even understand blockchain, what they understand is investment and making money. So if you're a would-be issuer and you're going to pitch a deal, you know, most investors, when you say blockchain, they're not going to go, oh yeah, that's great. They're going to kind of, you know, raise an eyebrow and now you're going to have to explain it to them. It becomes an obstacle when you're raising capital. Relating back to what I was saying about compliance earlier, like if the best thing that your tech protocol does is to get you to the point that you already were without blockchain and the offering that you have is already attractive to investors, why on earth would you mix in blockchain and add this extra layer of friction when you're trying to raise capital for your business. So because of that, I think that a lot of the offerings that we are seeing right now are actually things that just couldn't get funded through normal routes. They're just not good investments, right? And they're kind of hoping to catch some of that dumb crypto money that we saw running around in 2017. But the thing is that ICO investors have no interest in safe 4% returns on asset backed stuff. What they want is that speculative 10 X overnight casino type gains, right? So, we have kind of a, a chicken and egg thing going here. Nobody's investing because nobody's making a good offering and nobody's making a good offering because there's nobody investing. Circling back to what I said at the start, really, we need to offer blockchain solutions that exceed what's currently capable with the non-tokenized approach so that investors who don't understand blockchain can be convinced, hey, this actually is a better route to go. I think that once we start to exceed what's possible without tokenization, then we might start to attract the kind of fabled institutional investors in a significant way. And when they do start coming in, they'll then become more familiar with the technology. They'll see the more nuanced benefits. And it's that network effect we talked about. At some point, we'll hopefully see that prophesied, you know, hockey stick growth of the industry 
And then we'll be laughing about the archaic time when uh, securities didn't exist on a blockchain. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you for sharing uh, what you guys do. Absolutely, and it was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah and thank, thank you for you. being with us.